day on Call Out. It's Whistler Sar to the rescue as the subject says goodbye to his family. Um, I miss you so much. I really need you now. I'm scared. And later, military SAR helicopter pilot rookies do their first live hoist. Knowing you have someone on the hook, it's an actual life on the hook, you know, you want to step up your game even more. Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Whistler Search and Rescue was called out to Brandywine Glacier, a popular spot for snowmobiling just outside of town. David Johnson was out sledding with a friend when he drove over an opening in the glacier and tumbled down a 30 meter deep bergschrund. A bergschrund is a crevasse formed when the moving glacier breaks away from stagnant ice. Fortunately, precipitation and avalanche activity have lined the bottom of the hole with snow and cushioned David's fall. In he goes and he bounces on against one wall of crevasse, another one, another one, another one, and and crashes down on the bottom and doesn't get clobbered by his machine. And his friends saw him go in. If no one saw him go in, that would have been a, in a bit of a horror show for us to go and try and find him. Trapped between ice walls and shaking from the cold, David uses his cell phone to record a video message to his family. Oh, I'm so sorry, you guys. I feel so bad. I came through that hole and I jumped at the last minute, but I hit the rocks and fell down the rocks. Oh, my ribs hurt so much. I'm standing up to try and keep warm. That's it, baby. You don't need to worry about me no more. I quit. It ain't worth it. Oh, I miss you so much. I really need you now. I'm scared. What David doesn't know is that paramedic and ski patroller Wayne Flan and two other SAR members are already on their way to the glacier. We'd sent an advanced team in there, three guys, just to uh, repel one of our members, the paramedic, down into the crevasse. It was pretty obvious when we got there because there was a track that led over a bump and then the track disappeared into the hole. And there was a few bystanders around who were with him and uh, we knew that's where the spot was. Down in the hole, the sound of the helicopter somewhat eases David's fears. Oh, helicopter just flew over. So hopefully it won't be much longer. I was trying to get my hands on. Oh. I climbed all the way up to there. It was brutal. I can't even believe where I am. This is just outrageous. The team must use ropes to lower Wayne down into the crevasse to evaluate the extent of David's injuries before they can determine how to get him out. To anchor the rope system in the alpine where there are no natural features such as trees, they dig two trenches in the snow and place a pair of skis inside each one. Then, they run a strap down from each pair of skis and fill the trenches with snow. The resulting system is very sturdy and consists of one belay line and one safety line. Carefully maneuvering around the unstable snow roof, the crew lowers Wayne halfway down into the hole. From there, it's a dozen meters on foot to the subject. I could actually walk the rest of the way down on a slope angle and then I got to the bottom and I started to assess him. He, he seemed okay, he was kind of a little out of it. He might had a minor concussion, he had some back pain, I think he had um, a compression fracture in his thoracic spine. Typically, an elaborate and time-consuming rope system would be used to raise the subject out of the crevasse. But with only two hours of daylight left, Whistler Saar decides to perform a challenging Hetz rescue long lining him out using a helicopter. You're going to just put an unattended line down in the hole? Uh, yes. With, with At the nearby Callahan Resort, the helicopter is configured for a HETS mission. Acting as spotters on board the helicopter are Binti Massey and Gavin Christie. Wayne's already up there with uh, the subject and we are pre-rigged in the helicopter here. 
And uh, as always, fighting daylight a little bit. A little bit. We should have enough time. Stationed just below the mouth of the crevasse and coordinating between Wayne and the rope team is SAR member Maddie Bodkin. The crevasse was not uh, vertical in nature, it was dog leg shaped and he was uh, down at the very bottom of something which was approaching 90 feet. So before we could um, start a HETS rescue with the helicopter, we had to raise the subject up to a platform where the helicopter could then pull the subject vertically up and out of the crevasse. I basically got him into the screamer suit, which is a suit that we use to pull people out on the HET system. We pulled him up to a point where he could actually stand on the snow slope and look straight up the hole, and that's where we got extracted with the HET system. So the helicopter comes in, and sure enough, the rope just was expertly dropped right in the hole, and you know we, we got it right down to uh, Wayne and the subject, who are still 50 feet below the the surface of the glacier and he clips on to both of their harness and the, the uh, message is given to the pilot now that we're into a lift and he lifts them straight out. I've never done this kind of a rescue before. I have a bird shrimp. They pulled us both up. When we came up I, I had to push off one little area of the rock face with my feet but we went pretty much straight up out of the hole. It worked out really well. It was unbelievable when they popped up out of the crevasse and we realized that we'd done it in the time frame and that you know, with the approaching nightfall being such a consideration, we had, we'd actually accomplished this. Uh, it was a pretty amazing feeling. They lifted us out. We went to another zone where we could land on the snow, and then another helicopter came in right away. He could actually physically walk himself into the other helicopter. We put him in a seat, I went with him, and we flew him right to the helipad where we transferred him to an ambulance, and then he brought him to the clinic. We managed to yank him out by rope underneath a helicopter just before grounding. Like it took about four hours to get him out of that one. If we would have had to use a conventional rescue by pulling him up with a two-rope system on a stretcher, et cetera, we would have been there until probably midnight. Thanks to their regular training, the team makes it off the mountain with only minutes to spare until sundown. We do a lot of practices for our rope rescue and uh, one of the practices we do is, is breaking down our stations as quick as we can. So we, uh, we broke the stations down and, and packed everything up and were able to ski to the bottom of the glacier uh, in a record time and loaded the machines up and we were, we were gone in probably under 10 minutes. It was pretty impressive. Now, live hoisting with military SAR pilot trainees. Finally, after 13 years of wanting to go primary SAR, I've, I've got my wish and I'm starting that. So it's a whole new adventure. At 442 Squadron in Comox, British Columbia, three experienced military pilots are learning to fly and operate the CH-149 Cormorant, one of Canada's dedicated search and rescue helicopters. At 74 feet long and weighing in at over 32,000 pounds, it's big, powerful, and fast. Today, the students are rotating through an overland hoisting exercise near the base of Mount Washington. At the controls on this training flight is Captain James Luce. Finally, after 13 years of wanting to go primary SAR, I've, I've got my wish and, and I'm starting that. So it's a whole new adventure. While en route, squadron training leader Major Jen Weisenborn communicates to the air crew a brief summary of today's objectives. Uh, this trip, uh, hoisting, starting with the uh, empty hook and then perhaps uh, some singles. Hoisting is done during rescue missions when the Cormorant helicopter is unable to land. Pilots must develop excellent hovering skills to keep the Cormorant stationary when hoisting, particularly during extreme winds and poor visibility. Now halfway into the three-month Cormorant pilot training course, the students are tested on their ability to fly into a confined space and hold a steady hover for live hoisting with search and rescue technicians on the line. These flying skills are critically important because if the helicopter moves out of position during the hoist, the line can sway and contact obstacles on the ground, causing injury to those on the hook. We, we trust each other. They trust us with their lives. Um, 
Really, we have their lives. When they're on the hook, we have their lives in our hands. The trainees are acutely aware of this, even with today's relatively calm weather. Knowing you have someone on the hook, it's an actual life on the hook, you know, you want to step up your game even more because the better hover that you can have, the easier it is for everybody's job. So that's what a search and rescue pilot needs, is a really steady hover. The Cormorant is equipped with two hoists in case one malfunctions. The cables are located in a compartment just above the side door. The Sartek clips onto the cable in preparation for lowering on the hoist. The flight engineer checks to ensure he's safely hooked up and that the hoist equipment is working properly. As the Cormorant approaches the target, the pilot's view is blocked by the nose of the aircraft and he must transfer con or control to the flight engineer who has a bird's eye view of the area under the helicopter. See, they can't see where, what's happening on the ground, so I have to tell them. Uh, I have to uh, tell them when to move, how to move. I'll call obstacles. There, you know, there's a three at three o'clock at 15 feet. So there's a lot going on. Clear communication between the pilot and his eyes, or crew members in the rear, is crucial at this stage. The instructor listens to every word. When we're in the hover, my job is to make sure he's managing the aircraft properly and that he's coordinating with the crew properly uh, in order to successfully hoist somebody down to the ground and back up again safely. Yeah, okay, so you have references. Okay. Right, now we can use those trees the When hovering over land, the pilot selects fixed reference points on the ground, such as a tree or large rock, to gauge the aircraft's position. In order to hold a high hover, typically you pick a reference off the nose, if you can, and then something off towards your 90 degrees, and maybe even something at your 45. While you're hoisting, you're talking, and you also describe to the pilot, you paint a picture of what's happening. The Sartek is a quarter way out, halfway out, three quarters, is approaching the ground. Sartex on the ground, he's disconnecting, this type of thing, so he knows exactly what's happening. Holding steady in a hover, the second Sartek is hoisted down from the cormorant. Both medics now on the ground. Captain Luce will circle the area, then return to pick them up. In a real emergency, the Sartex would be tending to the injured now and preparing them for extraction. Captain Luce eases the cormorant into position as the Sartex watch from the ground, fighting the intense force of the rotor wash. With the helicopter once again in a steady hover position, the hook is lowered by the flight engineer. The Sartex connect onto the line in what is known as a double hoist. Sartex back in the helicopter, Major Jen Weisenborn prepares to initiate another hoist exercise when there's a problem. One of the hoists has malfunctioned. The inboard failed and I tried to do a reset and it didn't work. We could have carried on with the external hoist, it's totally legal. But because that aircraft is on standby and the other aircraft that was available was busy, we elected to go get it fixed so that if there's an actual call out, we have two serviceable hoists. The hoisting exercise is terminated and the Cormorant crew returns to base for repairs and the instructor's review of the student's performance. Very uh, 
Windy conditions all across the south coast today. Friday, 8 a.m. The search and rescue team at 442 Squadron in Comox, British Columbia is briefed on the weather. Has already reached 80 knots. The forecast is not promising. Winds are picking up to near hurricane levels. This, of course, is when the action happens in search and rescue. When the conditions get uh, less than ideal, that's when they usually get called. It's pretty rare that on a blue sunny, uh, sunny day that they get called out. 8.35 a.m. The storm has taken its toll. As 442 is called out to a vessel in distress in the waters close to Port Hardy on the north end of Vancouver Island. With no time to spare, the crew prepares the cormorant for takeoff. 8.43 a.m. Less than 10 minutes go by and the mission is stood down. The Coast Guard is on scene and the weather is still very unpredictable. The aircraft commander on the Cormorant decides to stay on base and not risk the lives of his crew. Ultimately, it's the pilot's decision to go ahead with the mission or to wait for safer conditions. Saying no to a rescue call is tough, especially when it's a matter of life or death. To be able to say no is a very difficult thing to do because you know somebody's in trouble, you know somebody's hurt, and you want to help them to the best of your ability and we're given a lot of tools to do that. So for the pilot to say no, he has to avoid all the variables. I still remember one trip where I got a call one evening to go out rescue a man who was overdue. He was a fisherman and his wife called and he hadn't come back yet. And I remember looking at the weather, it was freezing rain. It was low overcast clouds, it was over the ocean and it, it just wasn't doable. I said, we'll come out at first light in the morning when the weather gets better and we did. And uh, we got out there, we found his boat. Uh, he wasn't alive, and, and to this day I wonder if we had been able to go out that night, could we have saved him? <clears throat> and uh, to make that decision is a very difficult one to do. The instructors decide to postpone training for the day. Bad weather is nothing new for a skilled search and rescue pilot, but for the candidates, it's best to learn the basics in calmer conditions. Hoisting Sartex onto a moving vessel will have to wait. Hurricane force winds outside, so that's a little bit beyond the uh, student's ability to learn effectively on it, not to mention it's, it's pretty tough on the aircraft. We like to work up to the, uh, the bad weather. It's certainly well within limits to go out and do a rescue, but it's just not a very good teaching environment. You have a pretty good idea with winds like today that you're not going to be going, but you still can't kind of relax. So you still got to check, check your no-towns, check your weather, be prepared as if you're going. Stood down on today's training exercise, the student cormorant pilots will have time to catch up on other tasks. Kind of do your own self-study or jump in the CPT and practice starts and emergencies. There's always administration to do or something. Work out at the gym is good. If you know if we know we're down for a few few hours or whatever, I'll run over and it's a good stress reliever for sure. With winds gusting to over 80 knots, the students take the time to reflect on the training at 442 Squadron. This course is designed to not only teach you about the specifics of search and rescue and what you might be faced with, but also to keep you challenged, to keep you thinking about different scenarios you may or may not encounter while you're flying. Uh, there's always an element of stress when you go up because you're learning a new skill, you want to do well, and the course is designed to keep you on your toes. Still, the candidates know that training scenarios are no match for real live rescues. In the real missions, that's when you're, uh, when you're really doing it. I mean, it's one thing in a, in a training environment when you, do, you have a Sartic on the hoist and it's a lot of fun, but uh, it's a whole other thing when there's a, a sinking ship uh, out at sea and, and, and you're there to hopefully save those lives and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully get them out of danger. So. The instructors know what it takes to be a search and rescue pilot. They try their best to prepare the students for real missions by sharing their experience and giving them challenging run-throughs. If we're over top of an area and they're handling it very well, we're going to start to throw curveballs at them just to sort of gauge them and prepare them for what they're going to see when they get to the units. For the instructors, search and rescue is their passion, even if they aren't doing it themselves. You're living vicariously through their accomplishments. Uh, it makes up a bit for the fact that uh, we don't 
at the school generally get to participate in rescues. We're, we're uh, helping other people to become a crew member to go, go uh, participate in rescues. Many instructors rotate back into live action with search and rescue squadrons, despite the odd hours and dangerous circumstances. The two o'clock in the morning calls on those miserable nights wear on your nerves a little bit. Uh, they were on my wife's nerves a little bit. Uh, I'm still having fun, so I'll keep doing it. The best part of my job is when I have my harness on and I asked for clearance to open the door because we're going to do some door work. And now my office is just it's this beautiful view. It's just the, <laughs> and it is very nice. I really enjoy my job. If anything, this week has taught the candidates two important lessons. Be prepared and be adaptable. On the next call out, live hoisting from a moving vessel. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.